pick up where we left off. Uh, I was just informed that uh, numbers uh, five and seven in this sequence don't have audio. Hopefully this one does. And hopefully we can catch up on the missing audio content. So this is uh, some code that we've started developing for going through, taking and reading a grammar that's in chomps, sorry, a context-free grammar from disk, and then eventually storing it as a data structure in some various classes that we've created in Python, and then with the eventual goal of converting it into Chomsky normal form, okay? So we're gonna go through some stubbed out code, and these are gonna be the methods that you will end up implementing, okay? All right, so we've got a class called symbol, and one of the things, if you haven't had a chance to watch num video number six yet, uh, was that I made the choice of incorporating the vocabulary, the concept of a vocabulary, into the symbol class, okay? And there's some good reasons for doing this. I'm not gonna completely go into those details of why. If you're interested, come talk to me, and I can go into that in more detail. It has to do with how Python handles storing data inside a dictionary or inside a set. And it turns out that if you're storing objects inside a dictionary or inside a set, the programming language needs to be able to do certain things. It needs to be able to test two objects to see if they're equal, for one thing. And it needs to be able to calculate a hash code to figure out where internally in the data structure it should store the things. Okay? If we don't so for the, for the default data structures, integers, strings, that sort of thing, Python already knows how to do this. If we create a new data structure, a new class like symbol, it doesn't necessarily know how to do these things. And by default, it's going to rely on object equality, okay? which is going to work fine in a lot of cases and in some cases isn't going to work. Turns out that if we handle things in this way using a dictionary, that's embedded inside this vocabulary-like class that every instance of, for example, NP will be the exact same object. And so this bypasses some of the problems that we could otherwise run into um, and lets us get away without diving very far into that, which is an intermediate concept that I don't want to get into right now. Okay, uh, but as you get in more involved in programming, especially in programming in other languages, this will be something that comes up in various circumstances that sometimes you have to implement classes or implement certain methods in classes in order to get them to behave properly in inside data structures such as dictionaries and, and sets. Okay, so the way that I did this was I created a static method which means that it's associated with the class, not with uh, instances of that class, called get. And get is going to take a key, which normally for us is going to be a string, although sometimes it might be none. Um, and then it's going to look. Is that key in our vocabulary dictionary? So here, symbols is a dictionary. It starts out empty. It is not associated with with instances of the class. It is a variable in the class itself. It doesn't get referenced by self, it gets referenced by symbol. So capital symbol. Symbol dot symbols is referring to this thing here, which is a dictionary, okay? So we're gonna say, is the key in this symbol dictionary? In other words, have we ever seen it before? So if, we've, if we're asking for the symbol NP, have we ever seen it before? If we have, then we return its value. So we look it up, we look that key up in the dictionary and return the associated value, okay? If this is the first time that we've ever seen that key, so if this is the first time we've ever asked for an NP symbol, then we hit the else clause and we create a new symbol with that key as the contents of, of the symbol. So here key is going to be a string, np, or some other string. 
and then we store that key, store that value associated with the, that key in the dictionary, and then finally return the symbol that represents that value. Okay? So this is very, very similar to what we did with the vocabulary class in the IBM models uh, code, except instead of mapping from a string to an integer, we're mapping from a string to a symbol object. But conceptually, it's a very similar concept. Okay? All right. Any questions on that? Yes. Static method is a special annotation. So we're annotating the method, and we're specifying that this method can be called directly on the class rather than on instances of the class. So I'll show you down here how we use it, and hopefully this will clear it up. So here, we want to create a symbol based on a string. So we're reading a line from a file. We split that line into an array or a list. So parts is going to be a list of strings. Parts sub zero is the first string. And we're saying, so symbol dot get. So we're calling it by saying the class name and then dot get. We can do that because we've annotated it as a static method. So it's saying this is a function that's associated with the class as opposed to a method that's associated with instances of that class. Yes? It means it can only be accessed within that specific, specific class. It means that in order to access it, we will prefix it with the name of the class. Okay. Uh, I think in Java you have to specify each time you create a new function if it's a static or private. Yes. So in Python, we don't. So why did this come up only here? Why do we only need static? So prior to this point, we have only dealt with regular member, member functions, um, methods. Okay. You're right. In Java, you can do the same sort of thing. The syntax is a little different. In Java, you would just say static and then the name of the function. Static, static, void, whatever. Okay. Here, the syntax is just a little different, but it, conceptually, it's exactly the same thing that you would do in Java. You, but you could create a static method. So it could be private as well? The issue, uh, the issue of public or private is completely orthogonal. To the, to the issue of whether it's static or not. Those are completely orthogonal issues. Okay. Yeah. You can have... They, they are completely distinct from each other. So they're on different axes. So you can have a method that is private, or so you can have a method that is static and public. You could have a method that is static and private. You could have a method that's not static and public. You could have a method that's okay. not static, that, that's, yeah. Why is that being produced only now? Why does a static method work in producing code too? Because it's a more intermediate concept that we didn't need in the other in the previous in the previous class. We don't strictly speaking need it here. We could have created a vocabulary class, created an, an instance of the vocabulary class, and called that method on instances of the vocabulary class. And in fact, I did that in one of the in one of the previous recordings okay. that got us to this point. I don't know if that was one of the ones that was missing the audio. It might have been. Yeah, so, and if we were going to do that, then we would have done this instead. We would have done vocab equals vocabulary, created a new vocabulary object, and then said left-hand side equals vocab.get parts sub-zero, like that. Which is basically what we did in the IBM models code. Okay, okay. here the data is being stored in a dictionary that's associated with the symbol class directly. Okay, Chase. So when we call symbol.get here, we did the first part, um, we have not created yet an instantiation of the symbol class. Exactly. We don't have an instance of the symbol class yet. Okay. Yes. Why 
Right, so the question is, why are we associating this with a class rather than an instance of the class? It is so that the data is held kind of globally, okay? So this dictionary of symbols needs to be distinct from any particular symbol object, okay? We want to be able to give this dictionary a string and get back a symbol object. So if I give it the string NP, I want it to give me back a symbol object that's, that represents a noun phrase, okay? And if I put it, so let's, let's imagine that I took off this static method, okay? So that's not there now, okay? And now we go back to wherever we were here. Okay, so now the question is, okay, how do I call that? So I can't do this anymore because it's not static anymore. So I, I can't use that syntax anymore. So the question is, well, what do I do instead? Well, what we originally did was this. We just did that, right? That was what we originally did. We just used we just constructed an instance of symbol using its constructor. That was what we originally did. But the problem is, let's look at the, at the grammar, the sample grammar. In the sample grammar, there's going to be several instances of NP. Well, there's two instances of NP, and then there's three instances of DT. So let's say we read this in. Okay, we read this line in, we construct a symbol object that represents a noun phrase right here, okay? Okay, so right here in, in read line, we call symbol that constructs a symbol object with NP being stored inside it, okay? Because right here we're reading a line. Yeah. That's this. Yeah. Yeah. And split says split this on white space into a list. Okay. Uh -huh. So parts sub zero is S, parts sub one is NP, and parts sub two is VP. And we have chosen by convention when we designed this data format uh, that the the zeroth item is the left is going to be interpreted as the left hand side of the context free rule. We just decided that. Okay? So parts sub zero is going to be this S right here. Okay? okay? So I construct this, I'm good, I go on. Now the next time read line gets called, it reads another S. Okay, so now at this point, we've got this S and we've got this S. And those are going to be represented by two different object in memory if we do it if we do it this way okay what I'm suggesting is that there are reasons which I don't want to go into but we can go into if you want me to uh, why it is nice under certain circumstances to have a single instance, in a single object in memory that will be used whenever we reference NP, okay? That's a design decision that I made, that I want there to be a single instance in memory representing NP. And whenever NP shows up in a rule, I want to refer to that single instance in memory. I could have made a different design decision, but I decided to go with that, okay? Now, because of that, I don't want to do it this way, okay? And instead, I said, okay, I'm going to store a dictionary, okay? This is going to be a global dictionary, okay? I could have said, I could have taken it and said, 
okay, look, let's just put this in the global namespace. Okay? It's just a global variable called symbols. Okay? And then I refer to that whenever I need to. Okay? But it is better practice to encapsulate the data when possible. So rather than just having this be in the global namespace, I'm going to make it in the, in the symbol namespace. Okay? So putting it here is almost exactly the same thing as putting it here. It just so happens that in, to refer to it, instead of just saying symbol in the global namespace, symbols in the global namespace, I refer to it as symbol, referring to the class name, dot symbols here. Okay? There's still just one copy of it. It's in a lot of ways very similar to having it in the global namespace, but instead it's in the namespace of this class. But there's still just one copy of it. Okay? And likewise with this method. By declaring it static, it's like I had declared it in the global namespace. It's like it's a standalone function. Okay? So I could have taken this and written a standalone function that's out here called get that refers to a standalone dictionary that's out here. Okay? Instead, I put it all inside the class symbol so that I'm not polluting the global namespace with these two things. What's the problem with putting the global space with these two? Well, let's say you import this module. Let's say you imported this code as a module and you had your own local variable called symbol, symbol or called symbols. Or you had your own local variable or your own local function called get. Then those two would clash and we wouldn't know which one was met. Okay? I also could have wrapped it in this vocabulary class and done it that way, but in this case I chose to just have it be static inside the symbol class. Okay. There might be other situations in which it would make more sense to create a vocab class like we did in the IBM example, but I wanted to show this as an example of another way of doing things. Okay. Good? Okay. So now, down here in read line, when we want to get a symbol, we don't call the constructor for symbol. Instead, we call symbol.get which looks it up in the dictionary, looks that key up in the dictionary, sees if it finds it. If it finds it, it returns an instance of the symbol. If it doesn't, it creates a new one and gives it back to us and stores it in the dictionary. Okay? All right, so we're reading the line. We're doing all these things. Uh, we've created a grammar. Another thing that I changed was the, the read lines file or the read lines method. Okay? This is in one of the uh, number six, I think, okay? or maybe seven. So I wanted to be able to pass a file-like object here. Okay? So in the unit test, I wanted to be able to define a grammar just right here as a string inside my test code. And it turns out that there is a module called IO that has a class inside it called string IO, 
which if you give it a string, will create something that looks an awful lot like a file. It looks and acts as if it were file-like. And then I can call grammar.readlines passing this thing that looks and acts like a file, but is not actually a file. And I can test this code right here. Okay? And then later on I can create another, another method that constructs a different grammar, and that way I don't have to read those, create dummy text files and read them from disk. Okay? I can define those grammars directly right here. Okay? All right. So what is this test case doing? So one of the things that we want to that we need to be able to do to convert a grammar from arbitrary context-free form into the more specific Chomsky normal form is we have to take care of epsilons. So Chomsky normal form dictates that if the language contains epsilon as a valid string then you must, have a sing you must have a rule that goes directly from the, the root symbol, which would normally be S, to epsilon. And that's the only place that epsilon is allowed to show up in your grammar. Okay? So if epsilon occurs anywhere else in your grammar, we have to get rid of those epsilons. Okay? So this is going to be one of the processes that we're going to do. And we're going to go through how, how, how to do that conceptually. Right here, we're saying we're going to construct a file, the pseudo file constructed from here. So this says a noun phrase goes to determiner. Determiner can be empty. A noun goes to dog. Noun phrase can be empty. Determiner goes to the. Okay. And we construct a grammar by reading the reading those files or reading that reading those lines. And now we ask the grammar to find the nullable symbols. Okay? These are going to be the symbols that could produce epsilon. Okay? So in this grammar, what symbols should it find? DT and NP. So yeah, by convention, in this file format, if you've only got one thing, that's saying you've got the left-hand side followed that goes to epsilon, goes to nothing. Okay. 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 And we can test that by running running the code and providing the sample file. And I made a mistake, unindent, line 89, oh, right here. There we go. Okay. So here was an example of an empty file, or an, em an epsilon production. Okay. okay, what about this? What if we had that? So we now allow NP to go to DT. Does that change the list of nullable symbols? You say yes. Does anybody here agree? Okay. What is the list of nullable symbols in this grammar? DT. Just DT. No. It is also NP. Even though it's got something on the right side, but that thing on the right side. Okay. Yes, because I could come up with a parse tree for the empty string where NP goes to DT dt goes to the empty string, which means that I could have, right, so which means that an np can ultimately produce the empty string, okay? And that's what this nullable symbols concept is saying. What are all of the non-terminals 
that could ultimately produce the empty string through some derivation. Okay? All right, so that's what's going on here. And so this, so we create a grammar. We ask that grammar for its nullable symbols, and you are going to implement that code. And then we say, okay, well, is the number of nullable symbols one? Okay, if we expect it to just be one. Okay. So, uh, let's say this is, this is the code. So right now, this code should pass. This test case should pass. The number of nullable symbols is one, and if I get DT, it is in the list of, null, it is in the set of nullable symbols. Okay, so should we test it? Error. Okay. Object of none type has no length. Okay. So it fails. Let's figure out why it fails. Let's go inside grammar to find nullable symbols. We haven't implemented the code yet. Okay, so when you have correctly implemented it, that test case will pass. Okay, let's come up with another test case that should work. Okay. Let's add NP goes to DT. Okay. Now in this one, the list of nullable symbol or the set of nullable symbols should be of size two. That should be the case. This should also be the case. That should be the case, not an or alternatively, assert false, okay, so n should not be in nullable symbols. Dog should not be in nullable symbols, it's a terminal. The should not be in nullable symbols. Okay, so we can make our test cases as explicit as we want. Okay, all right, so what do we do to find the list of nullable, to find the set of nullable symbols? Okay. Step one. What is step one? Okay, here. Let's do this by hand. What is the first thing? So when I asked you, what are the nullable symbols here? What was the first thing that you did in your head? Looked for blanks on the right side. Exactly. So you looked, so let's formalize that. Okay. So in the grammar, we have access to rules. So the grammar encapsulates a list of rule objects. Each rule object contains a symbol that is the left hand side and a list of symbols on the right hand side. Okay.
Okay? So if, if the right-hand side consists of an empty list, okay? Uh, I don't remember if we implemented it that way. We might have also implemented it as a symbol so that the right-hand side, if it's, if it's epsilon, that it's a single symbol that represents epsilon. Okay? So if, if it's a single symbol, if the list is a single symbol and the single symbol in the list is epsilon, that would also mean it's nullable. But either way, we're conceptually looking for rules that directly derive epsilon. When you say epsilon, is it literally an epsilon there? No, it, it, epsilon is the name that we are giving to the empty string. Okay. Yeah, it is not a literal epsilon symbol. Although, when we print it, we tell our print to print an epsilon symbol just to make it easy to see. But that's by convention. We wouldn't have to do that. OK, so that's step one. We look through the list of rules. And for every rule that has epsilon on the right-hand side, we say that the left-hand side is a nullable symbol because clearly that symbol can produce the empty string. Okay. So, step one, find the initial set of nullable symbols. Okay. So we're going to break this down. So we're taking a complicated problem and breaking it down into simpler component steps such that each simple component step is easier to implement than the complicated thing that we started off with. Now, if the simple thing that we're trying to implement is still compli too complicated, then we could further break it down into parts. And eventually, we're going to get to the point that some part that we're trying to implement is going to be su sufficiently simple that we can implement that part by itself and ideally write test cases to, va to validate, to, to convince ourselves that the code that we've written works and works properly. Okay? All right, so what does this function do? What does this method do? This is a method inside the grammar class that says, we, we call it on a grammar, and it is going to return the set of symbols that appear on the left-hand side of a unary branching rule where the right-hand side is epsilon. Okay? Does that make sense? Conceptually, what do we need to do to implement that function? If I ask you to do that, with this grammar, what are the steps that you do in your head to come up with the list? So for this grammar, what is the list, uh, what, what are the nullable symbols? What are the initially nullable symbols? S. S. How did you do that? That's not how you did it. That's part of how you did it. But you didn't just say there's an epsilon on the right hand side. Imagine that you are a computer. What are the steps that you go through? If you gave this to somebody else who had no idea what we were talking about, who had not watched these videos, and you, you've got a friend and you say, here, find the list of nullable symbols. What are the steps that you are going to have to tell them to do to come up with that? What a nullable symbol is. Okay, you have to tell them what a nullable symbol is, and that was the part that we started about. So a nullable symbol is something with epsilon on the right hand side. Okay, but now there's there's another critical piece that we have to do. Yes, go line by line. Go one. Start at the first line and go line by line. Okay, so iterate through all of the lines. For each line, 
look at the right-hand side. If the right-hand side is epsilon, then save the left-hand side as part of the set. And when we're done walking through all of the lines, return the set that you gathered in that process. That is exactly what you have to do to implement this function. Yes? So for the grammar that we have in this file, for the DT that has epsilon on the right and D that has DT on the right, uh, this memory variable should only return DT because it's only. Yes. No, this should not return anything. With Given this grammar, this method should return only dt. And that is exactly, well, that's not exactly what we're testing. We could test that. So we could, here we're testing a larger method, but we could write a test case that just tests this method. And in fact, you should do that. Okay. So that was step one. Now, what's step two? Step two is find more nullable symbols. So, given a set of nullable symbols, that's this, where do you think we might get that set from? From calling the other function, from calling that initial list. So we call that initial list, and then we provide it here. Oh. Yeah, so step two, use the results from step one to call find more nullable symbols. Okay. What does find more nullable symbols do? Well, given that initial set of nullable symbols, which for this grammar would contain only dt, return a new set of nullable symbols, which in this case would be nothing. But in the other example, in this example, would be np. Okay. So in this example, the first call, find initial symbols, is going to return dt because it has epsilon on the right-hand side. And find more nullable symbols will return np, the set containing np. Okay. The returned set will consist of symbols that appear on the left-hand side of rules. So NP is on the left-hand side. And it's going to be rules in which all symbols on the right-hand side are in the initial set of nullable symbols. Or rather, they're in this set of nullable symbols. Yes. So now, this function is going to look through your list of rules. And if all of the rules, if all of the symbols on the right hand side are nullable according to this set that you were provided, then we're going to add the thing on the left hand side to the new set that you will eventually return. If all of them, if all of them are nullable. Was the nullable symbol in this on the same page? No. The question was, isn't epsilon and a nullable symbol the same thing? And the answer is no. They are related concepts, but they are different. Epsilon represents literally the empty string. So epsilon literally represents the empty string. Um, 
a nullable symbol is a non-terminal. Like the DT. Like DT or NP that we have identified is capable of producing the empty string, is capable of ultimately deriving the empty string. See the difference? Okay. Okay. So what do we do for find more nullable symbols? We're going to iterate through the list of symbols. Sorry, strike that. We're going to iterate through the list of rules in the grammar. And for each rule, if all of the symbols on the right hand side are nullable according to, the, to this list, to this set of nullable symbols that we were provided, then we add the left hand side of that rule to the new set of nullable symbols. After processing all of the rules, we then return this new set. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So, you should be able to take this and write more unit tests that test just this function. Okay. So you should be able to write a, a unit test that takes. Well, let's let's go ahead and do that. Let's. Okay. So Okay. Okay. So we're instead of calling get find nullable symbols we're going to call find initially nullable symbols. Okay. That list of initially nullable symbols is going to be one. It's going to contain DT and it is not going to contain NP. Everybody good with that? Okay. Now we're going to say newly nullable symbols equals grammar dot find more nullable symbols. Okay. So we're going to provide it the set that includes DT and ask it to find more. Okay. So now, what should this new set contain? And I shouldn't have changed this one. Okay. So now, should DT be a newly nullable? No it would have been in the original nullable symbols. What about NP? Yes. Okay, and none of the others should be. They should all be false. Okay, so we could test, run this code when we've got our implementation and test it and see if it works. Okay, so this process of walking through and creating good unit tests should help you correctly implement the code. The two things should, should, be, should, should be kind of two sides of the same coin. Because as you are thinking through the process of the logic of implementing the code, that should help you think about, OK, well, under what conditions should I expect things to be true or false or equal or not equal? And likewise, as you go through crafting unit tests, that should help you think through, OK, do I understand the logic properly of what I'm supposed to be testing? Okay. Do you need tests in the test cases? Is this... A unit, so there's different levels. So the question is, is, does a unit test just mean a test case? Um, 
Yes and no. So a unit test is going to be one of these methods. Okay? It is called that because it is testing a unit of your code. So it is testing a small component of your code. A test case, so a unit test is a kind of test case. You could have more complicated test cases that encompass a number of unit tests. You could also have test cases that are not unit tests, that are higher level tests, that are doing functional testing or integration testing. Yes? Yes. Yes. No, it'll tell us. So we are inheriting. So we're creating a class that inherits from this unit test case. And then down here, we are calling the main of unit test. So the fact that we inherit from unit test under the covers is causing these methods to be registered so that they get run at runtime. Okay. Okay. So now let's go back here. So we find the initially nullable symbols. We use the results from that step one to find more nullable symbols. Are we done? Have we now found all of the nullable symbols? Okay, I've got one person who says no. Why? I'll say no because if we had a larger grammar, like for our grammar, we're done. But if we had a larger grammar, then you move one step further up the chain and you'll still end up with possibly more. Yes, that's correct. So given a larger grammar, it is possible that now that we found more nullable symbols, we could run, find more nullable symbols again, and find more nullable symbols. Because things that, rules that previously were not nullable, now might be nullable, because we found more nullable symbols. And so there, was, there could be a rule that before, something on the right hand side was still not nullable, but now it is. So let's construct such a grammar. Okay. So let. Why are we constructing such a grammar? Why can't we be satisfied with that? Why are we constructing a grammar? Why aren't we just satisfied with this? This is a perfectly acceptable grammar that allows us to test one thing that we were interested in testing. But. In a larger grammar, it is possible that we are going to encounter this situation, and we therefore want our code to be able to handle that situation if it comes up in a real grammar. But a real grammar is much, much, much complicated. Exactly. So a, a real grammar is going to be much more complicated, but we're going to break it down into, into a simple grammar that we can still easily understand, but that will test the code in a way that makes us more confident that if we give this code to a real more complicated data set, a real, so if we give this code a real more complicated grammar, that it will, we'll, we can get more confidence that our code will behave properly on the more complicated case. Okay, so what would be an example of a more complicated case? There. How about that?
It's a terrible set. It's a terrible grammar. I mean, it's not coming. The, the goal is not coming up with realistic grammars. That'll come later. The, the goal here is to test the code. Okay? So the first time through, what is find initially nullable symbols going to return? V and DT. Okay? Why did people say V first? Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, it'll, it will return DT and V. Sets, sets are inherently... Uh, so the question was, why do people return V instead of DT first? Because a set is an inherently unstructured and unordered data set. So you construct the list in order, and then it returns in arbitrary order, because a set is unordered. Okay? Uh, and his internal representation of a set happens to store the V before the DT. Okay? That is actually a good description. <laughs> Okay, so initially, find initially nullable symbols is going to return v and dt. Okay? Okay, and one will fail, so let's change that to two, and then let's add cat. Okay, so initially nullable symbols will return two items in its set. DT will be in that. V will be in that. Okay? Okay. Now we have newly nullable symbols. We call it again. Or we call it the first for the first time. Okay. What should be true and false? Let's look at the grammar. VP should be in newly nullable. Anything else? NP. Yes. No, we will not get S this round. Because it's not in nullable symbols. Because it is not currently in nullable symbols. Sorry, just a quick question. I don't understand what's the logic of this new nullable. I don't know what's going on. Okay. The goal of this whole process is in the big picture going to be that we want to take this grammar and come up with a new grammar that is weakly equivalent to this grammar. In other words, it comes up with the, it derives the exact same set of strings. Okay. Why would I want to do that? We'll get there. So why would we want to do that? We want to do that, ultimate, we, we ultimately want to do that for practical reasons, because it is more tractable to write an algorithm that parses a grammar in Chomsky normal form than it is to write a grammar that will parse an arbitrary grammar. Okay? So it's more efficient to write a, there is a, there's a nice simple algorithm for parsing a grammar that's in Chomsky normal form. If the grammar is not in Chomsky normal form, things get more complicated. Okay? One of the steps in converting a grammar to Chomsky normal form is to ensure that the only rule that contains epsilon is from directly from the root symbol. And that's only allowed if the grammar produces the empty string. If the grammar is allowed to derive the empty string. Otherwise, epsilon will appear nowhere. 
Okay? So the step, the first step in rewriting our grammar is going to be identifying which non-terminals are capable of deriving the empty string. Okay? Then we'll do some cool new stuff with that. But we have to do this first. Okay? All right. So our initially nullable symbols are going to be dt and v. The first time we run get more, we'll return vp and np. The next time we run it, get more, we'll produce s. Okay. If we try to run it again, it will produce the empty set, at which point we know we're done. Yes. If we, if we provide, here, I'll, we'll go through this, it'll be clear in a second. Okay, so find more nullable symbols should be true for NP, true for VP, and false for everything else. Did I get that right? Because DT is nullable, so NP becomes nullable. V was nullable, so VP becomes nullable. Okay? All right. Now, at this point, we need to update nullable symbols, which was originally DT and V. We need to add all of the things from newly nullable to that set. And in Python, we can do that with the update method. So update will take an iterable, in this case a set, and add all of those things to the left-hand side. Add. We still need the initial ones. In this particular example, we don't, but in other examples, we might. For example, what if we had QP goes to NPV? NP was in our new list, or in our new set, but V was only in our original list. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to call this again. Okay, and this time what do we find? Newly nullable now should contain S. Because you added a V? No, because of this. Because, because at this point, NP and VP are both nullable. Oh, okay. And because everything on the right-hand side is nullable, S gets added to the newly nullable. So that was only because you added a VP. Not necessarily, but just... What was it? Nullable? This time through the iteration, we start off with the nullable symbols being DT, NP, VP, and V. We iterate through every rule. When we go to this rule, every item on the right-hand side is in the nullable set. Therefore, the left-hand side gets added to the newly nullable set. Okay. Okay. At this point, we do this again. And self dot assert equal length nullable 
is 0. Yes? So I can see how we know what our grammar looks like when writing this test case, and so we just wrote this thing three times. Yes. Um, but for like practicality's sake, for a larger grammar, can we just like have some timers in there and make sure that it's ah. right? Yes. Just for, like, run. So the, the question is, we did this all by hand, we wrote it out, we exploded it out, we wrote this call and then this call and then this call, we ended up calling update three times. Shouldn't there be a better way? Clearly the answer is yes. Use a loop. Okay? And if we go back here, this method is where you would put such a loop. Okay, So here you're going to find your initially nullable symbols. You're going to use the results from step one to find more nullable symbols. And then step three, add the newly nullable symbols to the set of nullable symbols. Use the results from step three to find more newly nullable symbols. Repeat steps three and four until the results of step four is the empty set. Return the set nullable symbols. Uh, could you make this a recursive function? Probably. Uh, my implementation of this function was not recursive. It used a loop. But I'm glad you brought up recursive functions because that is what we are about to talk about next. Okay. All right. So assume that we now have the list of nullable symbols. Okay. What do we do with it? Well, so we're going to rewrite this. Eventually, we're going to get rid of all of the rules that directly have epsilon on the right hand side. But it turns out there's more that we need to do than that. Okay? Consider rules of this form. So that rule has two things on the right hand side. Each of them is potentially nullable. Okay? Which means that we could have VP derive the empty string, but NP could still derive dog. Okay, which means that the string dog is valid in this language. Okay, so S could derive just dog. Why? Because VP could derive the empty string, so we have just NP derives dog, VP derives empty string, dog plus empty string is just dog. Okay, which means that if we're going to eventually get rid of epsilons, that would get rid of the ability for VP to derive nothing, but we still need our grammar to be able to derive dog, which means we're going to have to add 
a rule that looks like that to allow s to go to np, np goes to n, or NT, np goes to dt, n, dt goes to nothing, n goes to dog. Okay? We're now going to have to rewrite our grammar. What are we going to need to add here? We're going to need to add a rule that says np goes to n. Because dt is nullable. We're going to have to add a rule up here that says s goes to vp. Because np was nullable. Okay? Which means that get is a valid sentence. So here we're going to have some recursion. Okay? So what's that going to look like? We're going to take a function, we're going to have to create a function that takes a rule and gives us all of the new rules that need to be created given a set of nullable symbols. And we're going to do that recursively. Okay? Okay. That's probably a good place to stop for today. I will go ahead and push this push this code, and you guys start working on the functions that we've talked about. Okay? So all of the methods, all of the methods that we've talked about, you'll be able to start start on. Uh, I let's see. You all have ac read access to the repository where I'm working on this. Uh, I will eventually create homework repositories that you will push to, but in the meantime, just make local copies of this repository so that you can work on it. This will actually be a good exercise in uh, using Git for actual version control uh, because I'll be continuing to make changes from here. You'll be making independent changes on your local copy, and then you'll have to pull from my copy and do local merges and then eventually you'll push to a remote that will represent your homework directory. Okay? All right.